Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Zilma da Silva from Texas AAM, and I'm going to try to tell you why I'm uh, uh, working on IoT and uh, you know what does it change in cloud. So when we first had the wave, and let me get my timer so that I know I'm on my three minutes. Uh, so when we first had uh, you know the first wave of workload for cloud, remember for, was Web 2.0, and things were moving so fast that it's not like you could really think how you code those workloads differently for that. And then we had uh, the analytics, you know, the the the. The light analytics, the, the Hadoop map reduce, spark things, and how we are going to resource management for them. And so many of us doing cl uh, cloud management from the provider perspective, at the time I was at IBM, were really looking at uh, how we can find out what this workload wants to do so that we do VM placement and allocation of memory, you know, ballooning between VMs and all that in a way that get us to overbook resources, at least for my projects. Then what, what happened um, that when the enterprise workloads started to come, the things became very conservative. So in my personal case, the product groups were not as eager to do tech transfer on my those things because they wanted the, the enterprise workloads to be very deterministic. And at that time I was, well, for whole, my whole career, I have this fight with the semantic gap where I want to know more about what is going on with the applications so that I can do the proper resource management. So many of my projects on the offside had all this benchmarking and workload characterization. So for cloud, my team did a benchmark for cloud without being adopted by SPAC. And I'm like, when am I going to work on applications that are not so many legacy? So I decided to move industries. I left IBM Research and I went to Qualcomm Research to see if I could influence how mobile apps were going to use the cloud, right? And uh, now uh, I'm now uh, looking at how IoT. So I did not succeed with the mobile. It was not only me. Let me see if I can tell you in less than a minute what happened with mobile. 2012, a lot of excitement about back-end as a service. Tons of startups. You probably are not really, well, what are they? The idea was to really have easy libraries that the people who program the front end of the mobile apps would use. And all these, you know, now platform as a service for mobile apps. Tons of startups, one that did a wonderful job was acquired by Facebook and ended up now we know being acquired for talent, not for the technology. Another startup doing a good job, people from Microsoft here, they changed their business models five times already. So it seems that our community, the mobile app people do not want to this platform as a service on the same way. They just want a notification service, a logging services, uh, in-app purchase, the stuff that both Microsoft and Amazon offer for mobile, okay? So now I'm looking at IoT again. People do not have a lot of apps developed, and I'm working now developing in the, you know, in the spirit of uh, Lindian and Jason, who went to really develop an application they could see the workload. I'm uh, developing an a IoT uh, infrastructure for two industries, I mean for two collaborators. One in smart manufacturing, and uh, the other one in um, autonomous vehicles. So we have a Texas AM one car, full of sensors, you know, researchers doing autonomous vehicles, and I'm doing the data services for that car. In those things, what I'm trying to do is have the latency. When you specify devices as a programmer, you tell me about the pattern of the data as much as you can. And when you specify queries, events, serverless computing, Right? You know, I, I'm using the paradigm of the serverless computing also with hope that I can influence that management stack because it just started. You only have Docker. 
So uh, on that sense, now I'm trying to make latency as a first class element of the, uh, of the runtime so that the programmer has to specify that. The system keeps carrying it across the services, combining those services and uh, uh, trying to see how well it's done, if it's violating, what is the problem determination. So, uh, so that's uh, uh, my spiel, is that latency Time series could become, you know, first element. I know some programming language people are looking into that, and I'm looking from the support on the cloud management stack. And I'd love to talk to any people working on IoT apps. We're having. But, um, so I'm going to talk about uh, four seat uh, project, uh, which is actually coming from a material genomics uh, initiative. The big, big picture is that uh, between the development of a new material and using that particular material in semiconductor industry is 20 years. And so the really big issue is this particular whole space needs help. We need material, semiconductor, data, digital, data collection. We need data curation, correlation, analytics, sharing, visualization. And so what's currently the space, the space is all these material scientists, all these semiconductor researchers are using flash drives. They use sneaker net to actually copy their data and keep them on the laptops. And so our current approach is actually to uh, develop um, a distributed uh, infrastructure from the scientific instruments like the microscopes and various other sort of scientific equipment to the cloud uh, and uh, enabling that actually not only the researcher to upload the particular data, but also then curate the data, search the data, correlate the data uh, between these different communities within the same community and different communities. And uh, so what uh, my particular group uh, and the researchers, there are currently Roy Campbell, Indy Gupta, um, and then other materials and, re and semiconductor researchers and professors um, working on is to design basically the networking and the backend cloud. Uh, particularly there, we are um, uh, aiming for uh, developing uh, the whole sort of distributed uh, middleware uh, infrastructure where currently the researchers are sending very heterogeneous materials type of data ranging from images to temperatures to pressures and so on. Uh, they also specify workflows, uh, wh what they actually want to be get done, uh, this task A, B, C, and then basically we are creating resource management we are creating, we have a pop up system, uh, messaging, queuing system, and the absolute goal is to provide real-time processing of these workflows, giving feedback, because the data uh, session on the microscope is very, very valuable. So it's, for us, it's real-time providing feedback to the researchers that they are visualizing the data, viewing them, taking another sort of sample, as well as secure particular communication, and so we are at this point, looking at uh, this particular space of uh, workflow processing um, in resource management and publish subscribe, we are using uh, some of the existing software as well as uh, developing some of our, so on, our own resource management uh, software, the Docker's Kubernetes, RabbitMQ for the messaging. Um, uh, and um, really providing, um, as in the first phase, uh, uh, storage and processing of these workflows, uh, enabling also interactive capabilities for these material scientists, semiconductor, clean room researchers to um, uh, work with their data in real time and securely. And uh, particular experimental results currently are quite encouraging. <laughs> for, well, one question over there while I get the next talk. <laughs> Is there a question? What is the number of, you know, number one thing that you do and why, how different is this kind of workflow and this, you know, data that you're getting that you didn't see from other work you guys did? Right. Um, one major um, issue is the heterogeneity. Uh, this particular data currently is 4K by 4K types of large scale imaging, plus basically all of the metadata plus actually free text, as they are currently um, um, annotating their experiment, what they are doing, we are actually providing interface at the microscope so that they can annotate. 
and that actually then needs to be stored, indexed, uh, um, NLP, basically we, we are providing actually tasks that we can extract the data uh, and so on. So there is, and actually also the freedom for these material scientists to say, extract this particular metadata. Uh, there are all kinds of sort of extractors that we are currently building, um, index them, correlate them, and so on. As I said, our goal is from 20 years to go to two years to uh, speed up. Hey, uh, my name is Anirudh Badam. I'm a researcher at Microsoft. I'm going to talk about uh, how we should be doing resource isolation or if we should be res doing resource isolation in the NVM and RDMA world. So uh, this, uh, these new technologies, NVM and RDMA, have been uh, uh, out around for some time now. Uh, at least, you know, battery back DRAM as one form of NVM. And the, 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 the mantra seems to be that the OS should only exist in the control path where you're doing space, security, and you know other management, and it should just basically get out of the, the data path. This is good for you know uh, scenarios where there's only one application running on the entire cluster, but what do you do for virtualized scenarios? You still need resource isolation. You see, uh, need resource governance. You know, some, uh, you know, there are reasons to believe that OS is the one that is causing these state latencies, but without the OS actually doing any of these resource isolation, I'm willing to bet you even median will get worse. Right. So, and specifically, you know, the reason why we need all of these things for the cloud is for accounting and pricing models. Uh, is the fact that accounting and pricing models depend on all of these things, and uh, and you know, also for provisioning, understanding, you know, what uh, what happens when you provision things in a certain way. You want to understand the performance implications of those. So the challenges are that you know there are several obvious solutions, but you know most of them seem to have some problems that you know that might not be a good match for how we run data centers today. So one is you know you can do post facto penalties you know maybe just go read a bunch of performance counters for these virtual machines that are sharing these resources and penalize VMs that are actually uh, abusing NVM or uh, RDMA which are actually causing problems for the others. But this is post facto uh, maybe uh, the damage is already done and this is probably just exporting the problem to a higher layer. What what does the application do? Does it you know somehow using software underclock itself or you know you're just pushing the problem one layer up? It's not really solving the problem. The other option is, uh, you know, maybe dedicate hardware, maybe dedicate chips, uh, like NV uh, maybe you know, pick a few NVM chips, give them to the each virtual machine. But the problem with this is that unlike DRAM, NVM has wear problems. So if you're going to do, if you're going to be pinning VMs to chips, you're going to be uh, wearing out these chips unevenly, and, not, and I don't think that's a good solution either. So in in conclusion, I guess I would like to ask the problem of is you know. We have the problem that the OS is slow because it's trying to do everything on a microprocessor that is not really optimized for anything. But at the same time, it does all these jobs that it did really did well, which is essentially ensuring isolation and performance, uh, providing performance guarantees. But these are essentially uh, these. Uh, uh, my opinion is that the benefits of NVMe and RDMA will be harder to realize in the cloud if we don't solve this problem uh, in the silicon or. Re uh, try to solve these problems efficiently in the in the CPU itself. So, from there, I guess I'd like to take questions. No questions. I decided that was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, I don't know how to start your slide deck. <laughs> oh yeah, keynote. <laughs> Gotta love keynote. So, there's a project that we started uh, about two years ago. Uh, uh, and we published a paper on it, uh, but we're not done. Uh, so Apple didn't like the name of the project, Sirius, uh, and sent us this letter, and so we changed the name. Uh, so I'll like to tell you about the new name, but we like that this letter recognized the, the wide skill impact that Sirius has had, and my chair was so excited about it that he wanted to include that in what will be my tenure case, that Apple's threatening letter actually recognizes that our work uh, has had impact. But we're not done, uh, and we've changed the name to Lucida. And our goal is to make this a cloud platform for AI. Uh, we want this to be the platform for building interesting AI systems. Uh, it's available now. It comes with a lot of components baked in, and really, really good infrastructure for training it, learning how to train it, uh, and growing it to be really smart. We're using it in a collaboration with 
uh, IBM on this Sapphire project to build uh, a sophisticated uh, conversational system for education. Uh, and each one of these boxes is a microservice that lives on top of Lucida. Uh, so I'm really proud to uh, announce that we're officially using Lucida as the platform for the Sapphire project. Uh, and another interesting project where we're using Lucida is in uh, a startup that we've created to create something interesting. And I'm going to spend 30, 30 seconds to a minute just kind of showing you how well this works. Clink has been in stealth mode building the planet's most intelligent personal financial assistant, a technology we look forward to revealing at TechCrunch Disrupt. Next is a live demonstration of a user talking to the financial assistant. This is real technology, not a concept video. Talk to me about your bank account. How much money do I have? You have $224,884.37 in your checking account a few seconds ago. Here is a history of your balance in the prior three months. Where did my money go in the last six months? You have spent $32,150.37 from your checking account since six months ago. Here is a breakdown of your spending. Show me my spending on travel. You have spent $53,900.88 from your checking account on travel, which is 40.95% of your total spending since two years ago. Here is a breakdown of your spending on travel. Show me my largest three transactions on travel. Here are the largest three transactions on travel since two years ago in your checking account. So, I'll stop it there. Should I spend $300 on a fancy oh, dinner given this all one. this travel? <laughs> It seems okay to spend $300 on dinner, which will reduce your checking account balance from $224,884. All right, so you kind of get the, get the gist of what we created. So that's real. And I actually was just showing Mike Taylor it working live. I can actually show it to anyone, my actual bank account, uh, so you can get some insights as to how my spending has looked. Uh, so if you're curious, come chat with me. My last slide, we just did a push to master uh, of Lucida, the, uh, uh, of the platform. It's available to everyone in the world. Um, we've done a nice readme and uh, get, getting started stuff. So if you want to build really well working cloud uh, intelligent assistance, I encourage you guys to look at Lucida as one, one viable option. Um, we're continuing to work on it. We've got people working full time on the platform. So we want to make it really great and would love your feedback. Yeah. How do I end it? Uh -oh. Escape. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now we have Michael Taylor. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about some work we presented recently uh, at ISCA um, on uh, ASIC clouds, um, uh, where we're looking at uh, specializing the data center. Um, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, the issue of, end of, of the end of Denard scaling. And uh, collectively, the architecture community has sort of uh, um, converged on kind of this idea of using uh, specialization, domain-specific accelerators, um, and near-threshold and weird devices to address this. But one of the questions I'm interested in is, is essentially, you know, we're, we're coming up uh, as, as part of the architecture community with all these accelerators, but who's actually going to deploy those accelerators? How are those going to actually end up in chips? And uh, from my experiences with uh, GreenDroid, I found that it's actually um, very difficult to get, you know, an accelerator into, uh, you know, mass market SOC that might go in a mobile phone. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that, um, you know, their high volumes uh, often uh, do not permit them to put, you know, kind of speculative silicon on there for some emerging domain. So uh, in this, in this uh, work, we basically looked at a different way of getting your accelerator out there, which is to build purpose-built uh, data centers that consist of large arrays of these accelerators. Um, so just like the accelerators, you know, just pluck them out of the paper, um, the ISCA paper, and then, you know, how do we deploy them in uh, essentially disaggregated um, servers? And uh, so in our work, we sort of target scale-out workloads. So you can imagine, like, Facebook users are uploading their uh, pictures, and then Facebook is spending uh, two seconds per picture on a GPUs uh, to recognize the faces. Um, and we saw in the paper there, there were uh, very high benefits to specializing the entire server for the accelerator. Um, so you might think this is kind of a, a weird idea, crazy, unlikely, but there are already ASIC clouds out there. So uh, ASIC clouds for Bitcoin mining are already consuming 300 to 500 megawatts of, of energy worldwide. And the compute power of, of Bitcoin ASIC clouds is at 1.2 billion GPUs equivalent. 
Okay, so there's a immense uh, computing capacity in the form of specialization that's already been deployed in this model. So I've actually been sort of curating a collection of these, and if you uh, come by San Diego, you can come see my, my museum of uh, decommissioned uh, Bitcoin miner hardware. So in our paper, though, we wanted to sort of expand this idea and look at other application domains. So we looked at uh, four different domains. We sort of started with Bitcoin because there's a lot of data on that. Uh, but we also looked at uh, video transcoding and deep neural nets, which are uh, you know, applications are already in the cloud and already occupying a lot of resources. So for instance, when you upload a video to YouTube, it gets transcoded to the Google VP9 format. So in the paper, we kind of came up with this prototypical architecture for an ASIC cloud. So you're basically taking this accelerator and then scaling it out in massive scale and then specializing everything around it. So the silicon is specialized, the PC board is specialized. You have an array of these ASIC chips, each of which can contain many copies of the accelerator. We also looked at how you integrate DRAM and uh, communication between the ASICs. So we built this flow that takes basically a, bo a ball of Verilog and then generates an entire server from it, including um, complete thermal dynamic uh, simulations, uh, or sorry, CFT simulations of the server. So we simulate uh, how the airflow goes to the server and uh, essentially optimize against the hotspots across the array of ASICs. Yeah. So we do uh, TCO and Pareto analysis. And then uh, I want to leave you with one <laughs> interesting insight about uh, ASIC Cloud, which is, you know, how much speed up do you need an accelerator to have before it makes sense? And the interesting result of this paper is that actually you don't need that much speed up. Like 2x is actually pretty good. What really matters is how big is the amount of money you're spending on the computation versus how much it's going to cost you to, in NRE, to build that ASIC Cloud. That's actually one of the most important things. So we came up with this two for two rule that's pretty interesting. So then I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Ricardo. And then the rest of the Microsoft speakers are in alphabetical order. So that means Ricardo, Yu Shang, me, and Todd, and then Stavros. All right, so can I You're allowed you, to speak, yeah. yes. Okay, so. <laughs> So instead of um, giving a technical talk, uh, given that this is the faculty summit, I thought I would talk about some of the lessons I've learned trying to bring my group's research to uh, practical use uh, at Microsoft. Um, and obviously, this is just my, my perspective. Um, so before I can tell you about um, Oh, and, and these lessons that I'm going to talk about might be useful for the faculty here, especially the more junior ones. So uh, I can't talk about the uh, lessons without telling you what the context is. Uh, what, uh, as some of you may know, um, I've, over the last 15 years or so, I've been doing research on software and hardware infrastructure for online services and data centers, initially at Rutgers um, and then at uh, Microsoft in the last two and a half years. So um, what I listed here is some of the uh, different um, pieces of research that we did that had a measure of impact. Uh, and I color-coded them, the ones in green are the ones from Rutgers, the ones in blue are the ones from Microsoft. Uh, and what I, I wanted to list this so that you saw that contributions can be of all sizes, small and large, and of diff many different types, could be concepts, tools, systems, and so on. So let's move on to the actual lessons. Um, the first, on the positive side, let me state here that this notion that only industry people should be doing research in this area is nonsense, okay? Uh, I think academic research can definitely have an impact. It's got its limitations, of course, but you can have an impact, especially if you have industrial collaborators. Um, and we've, um, and even if you don't have industrial co collaborators like we didn't at, uh, when I was at Rutgers, you can always bring uh, your industry colleagues' uh, uh, attention to your work. So you might come to them and if you think you have something really good that might eventually have potential impact, just talk to them about that one topic. Um, another interesting thing that we found in our experience is that it's really difficult for academics to properly estimate or accurately estimate um, costs and TCO. Uh, but ballpark estimates are very possible. 
Uh, so what I'd suggest there is instead of trying to make definitive statements about TCO, it might be a good idea to focus more on cost sensitivity analysis. Um, perhaps more interestingly, um, it's very easy in, in academic research to oversimplify and miss uh, practical constraints and requirements. This happened to us a few times. But at the same time, in research, be it academic or not, we tend to try and introduce complexity and sophistication, right? Uh, research that's deemed too simple doesn't go very far. So um, the, the point I would make here is that um, practitioners really worry a lot about things like manageability and upgradability and those types of aspects. So any sophistication that you put into your systems or your designs should be uh, sort of compared against those costs. Um, so finally, um, Catherine is getting antsy there. So the bottom line is that impact is, is very possible, but you know, try and think long term, right? Don't try to solve the problem that we have right now or the industry has right now because we're likely already working on it. Uh, but stay a few years ahead. Uh, and obviously continue producing these great students who have expertise in this area. Thanks. Hello everyone, I'm Yu Xiong He from Microsoft Research. By now, I hope that you heard a good amount of tail latency to believe it's actually important for interactive services. So here I'd like to share with you some of our findings, observations on the opportunities and challenges we use in parallelism to reduce tail latency. Parallelism is promising for reducing latency because many interactive services are CPU intensive running on multi-core servers with available idle cores. On the other hand, using it effectively to reduce tail could be challenging. One major reason is that uh, requests exhibit very different service demand. Many requests are short, but a few requests could be very long. We want to make best use of those idle resources to parallelize those long requests only, reducing the tail. Well, we just want to run those short requests sequentially since it will not affect the tail anyway. To parallelize long requests only, there are two main approaches. First is to use predictive parallelism. That is, we predict request service time before execution, then based on that, decide parallelism degree. The advantage of the approach is that we can parallelize those predicted long requests at earliest possible. Another approach is dynamic parallelism. Here is that uh, we increase the parallelism degree of the request along request execution. By doing that, we essentially give less parallelism to those short requests and more parallelism to the long request without knowing the service demand of those requests are prior. So both approaches are powerful. Which one to use depend on for a given workload, how easily and accurately you can predict the parallelism, uh, the service demand. You can also combine the two approaches. For example, upon request arrival, we make a prediction on the service demand of the request, decide parallelism degree. If after a certain target latency, the request hasn't completed, this could be a good sign that maybe the prediction is inaccurate. In that case, we apply dynamic correction at parallelism degree and the hopefully complete request on time. So such a hybrid approach could embrace the advantage of the both parallel predictive and dynamic parallelism. So if you are interested in using parallelism to reduce tail, there's a lot of a lot more information you may find uh, in our work on how to use these techniques effectively. Last but definitely not least, I want to thank all my collaborators. Thank you, Shang. Mm -hmm. 
So we believe tail latency matters. My view of what, uh, for practical economic reasons, what's going to happen in the hardware is not only specialization, but this middle point where we have big and little cores that can meet a power budget but add lots of computational uh, uh, power. But in order to make that vision work, you need some software, as well as some software that uh, helps with uh, 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 specialized cores. And so, and it's parallel, so you have to deal with parallelism and heterogeneity. So in terms of some insights and results we've had in that area, uh, tail requests reveal themselves. You saw that in Yusheng's work. The longer something's executing, the more likely it is to be a long query. And, you, and if that's your tail, and, and it's caused because of more work and not because of random events, you need to do something about it. And so we were able to show that the best hardware for this is heterogeneous, not homogeneous. So if you're optimizing for the tail, you need a range of hardware capabilities. And no one's still building servers like that, so I think that that's a huge opportunity for uh, industry. And the one, some of the other insights uh, that for, for a tail that's caused by a random event from Google is to do this replication and, and to burn extra work for that. Some recent work we uh, just published at ATC has, uh, is extending some of the ideas of co-location to work at a much finer granularity with some new mechanisms. So we're uh, taking a latency critical workloads such as Bing and batch workloads that aren't interacting with users and co-locating them. And the way we're doing is we're putting it on one SMT core and we're using the two lanes of the SMT but not at the same time. And so the, when you have lots of requests arriving, they arrive, they finish their work, they leave the core idle, and so there's lots of little bits of idle time all over the place. And so we fill those little bits of idle time up with batch workloads by observing the partner core. And so the sharing that the SMT does that would normally destroy your tail latency is not impacted at all, and if you wanna see the results, we were incredibly surprised. Why is there only one line? Because all these things perform exactly the same. We did not degrade tail latency at all. In fact, we improved it slightly. And someone uh, alluded to the fact that the cores will go in low power mode. Well, if they're always running the batch load, they don't go in low power mode, so they're always ready and running at their fastest when a latency sensitive request comes in. And it even works on multi-core. And that's uh, a factor of nine improvement in utilization with no loss in tail latency. So we were extremely surprised by this result. Next. <laughs> Hi, this is uh, work we've been doing on extending the class of applications uh, beyond embarrassingly applic uh, parallel applications that we want to run in the data center. I think a lot of what we've talked about today is how to take something where we already know how to parallelize, make work efficiently in a, in a, in a data center. Um, <clears throat> but there's a lot of algorithms, important algorithms, that, are, that, have, that have dependencies, sequential dependencies. And so what we've been looking at is trying to break those dependencies in order to um, induce parallelism. So largely speaking today, the, the, the state of affairs with how we go about parallelizing the algorithms is looking for independent computation. And so our insight is that we can actually use an idea, ideas from symbolic, uh, Paracel is the name of our, our groups, our internal group. We can use the, an idea of symbolic execution to break dependencies uh, in algorithms which have, these, which have dependencies. And as a consequence, we can use then, uh, uh, we put on our, our symbolic optimization hat and make that a symbolic opt optimization quick, we can actually get a parallel algorithm. So there are many types of dependent computations that exist in the data center that are important, like log processing, uh, dynamic programming is an instance of the, for instance, Viterbi algorithm, which is used in speech recognition. Uh, a bunch of machine learning algorithms all have dependencies. And so we want to actually um, break those dependencies, right? So suppose that I have F, G, and H. This arrow here is denoting that there's a dependence between these three algorithms, these three stages of computation. Traditionally, you have to have G wait for H. I'm sorry, G wait for F before it can continue. We're going to break that with symbolic execution. Um, so here is a recipe for how to do this. This is, not a, this is a mental model for how to parallelize an algorithm. This is not an automatic push-button approach. 
Usually you have some local data to FG and H respectively. In order to make it parallel, you add a, break that edge and add a symbolic value. For instance, G is going to have a symbolic value X, and it's going to partially evaluate on its data with respect to, to X, right? So now when I actually get uh, the computation, I just compose these outputs, and I have a parallel algorithm. Right, you give me any sequential algorithm with dependence, this is a mechanism to give you a parallel implementation. Now clearly, whether or not this works in practice depends on a lot of things. Uh, in particular, we need to have a fast symbolic execution, and we have to build, effectively build what are we call, we're calling concise summaries, right? The composition also needs to be, be fast. Um, and that's where I think that, that's the, kind of the, the, then the, where the automation breaks down. Now it's up to the programmer, us in particular, to actually make this stuff very quick. But that's okay because that's a, you know, it's an optimization problem as opposed to a very ad hoc process of parallelizing an algorithm. This gives us a bit of a way to actually translate this process of parallelization into an optimization one. Okay, so with that, um, I'm going to end and just point to two papers that I think might be uh, instructful if you want to learn. I didn't give you any details on how we do it. Uh, find me afterwards if you're interested. But we have a, a CACM paper coming out as well as a recent SOSP paper that I think highlights a lot of the ideas here. Thanks. Thank you.